good man of the house. You know, this is usually utilized in uh, parables spoken by Christ, and it is even mentioned in Mark. If, if you don't understand this parable, the first one we're going to start begin with, you're not going to understand any of them. And it, the parables are likened unto a householder or good man of the house. Now, the wor the word okas despo Potes uh, is, is the word householder. It is made up of despotes, which means husband. Husband, it can mean master or lord. Okay, It's whoever the head honcho is. Okay, That's what it's talking about. And of course, uh, okas or akas means dwelling place or a house. Languages are interesting. And of course, I'm quoting from Greek. But ikos, many of you are familiar with Latin, casa. Mi casa, yo casa. I'm, I'm not really meaning that. <laughs> but I, I, I jest, okay. But it, it's amazing how languages hang together pretty well, okay. But your casa is your casa. Your home, your dwelling place is the place where you want a good person hitting that house. So what are your choices? Your father, Almighty God, should be the head of your house, okay? Because whether you like it or not, he is the head of the houses, all houses, because he is the good man of the house, the one that has the final word. And he who has the final word and has the power and the strength to make it stick, that's our Father Almighty God, then uh, he's, he's the good man. But that's what's important. He is good. He always does things fair. He never shortchanges you. There, if, if there seems to be a time in your life that you've been shortchanged, you better check out old self, all right? Because it's either maybe somebody that has shortchanged you, but your father will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never shortchange you. Now, if you happen to be one of God's elect, he's going to use you. And I mean he's going to use you good. We'll be speaking of one parable today where some people came to the garden working for him and they agreed, we're going to work for a penny today. Boy, the sun come out and it is popping down and all the way to 5 o'clock in the day, there were still some new ones come along. He said, well, you get out there and work, and he gave them the same thing. Boy, they felt short-changed. But yet they made a deal. Penny. We'll work all day for a penny. And God kept that word. That's, that's good, because he's showing you that he does keep his word. And naturally, the in-depth truth is that it's such a pleasure serving him and having his blessings that it's best to be with him all day than it is just part of the day. Because a lot could have gone bad there in the other part of that day. So, having said that, open your Bibles, if you would, to chapter 10, the great book of Matthew. We're going to stick in this book of Matthew today. Matthew chapter 10, let's pick it up with verse uh, 16, where Christ is preparing the troops to send them out. Everybody thinks... It's such a wonderful thing to be able to serve the Lord. It's just going to be peace, and you're not going to have anything but good people. Everything will be lovely and, um, and be just fine, okay? So this is his advice as he sends them out. Beginning with verse 16, Matthew chapter 10. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. In other words, be sharper than the wolves are. Why? Wisdom teaches you how to go through it, over it, under it, around it, or simply to take it out. Okay? That's what wisdom does. And when you're wiser than the serpent, which is to say Satan... You're not going to, in as much as God has given you power over him, you're not going to let him in your house anyway, or with your family. You're, in the name of Christ, you're going to order him out. But what has Christ said here? I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. 
never forget what the protection of a sheep is. A sheep doesn't have big claws. A sheep doesn't have big teeth to tear and rip. The she a sheep is absolutely helpless, with the exception of one thing. That's the shepherd. And the shepherd will take care of that sheep wherever they go. That lamb that goes astray, he'll leave the whole herd and go after them. That's his promise. And his promise also is they are mine and nobody, nobody can take them from my hand. So uh, what he's saying here is you go out, but don't you forget who your protector is, basically, and be wiser than the serpent and yet harmless as a dove. You know, I've got about probably 60 to 100 doves that I feed every day. And they are so, they make such a loving, peaceful sound when they coo. But boy, don't you ever hanky with one of those doves' nest. Woo! A little old dove will fight stronger and longer for her size and weight, protecting her nest. So, uh, there. God expects us to learn from nature. That's why he utilizes nature so much. Now, what about the serpent? Well, I don't, I don't know. Do you trust a snake? Hey, good buddy, come here and jump in my pocket. Or let's play church with you. I'm going to hypnotize you. Well, now that's ignorant. You know why? A, church doesn't, a snake doesn't know how to play church. A snake, is, by nature, has one thing in mind. If you bother him, he's going to smite thee. And he is poison, <laughs> okay. So, and, and there are some pretty good hypnotists, you know, that can zero in. But sooner or later, you play with snakes. They haven't read the Bible. They'll bite you, okay. They will get you good. So there's so much in that one verse that Christ sends you out to be aware of those things. There's trouble out there. But you will conquer. You will overcome. Verse uh, 17, but beware of men for they will deliver you up to councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And of course this looks forward as it is written in, in Mark 13 and Matthew 24 of when the false Christ is on earth and people are delivered up before him. All right, And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. For whose sake? For Christ's sake for teaching truth, for believing truth, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Gentiles should be tra translated nations, against the nations that come against God, or, or I'll say it, non-Christian nations. Well, that's not politically correct to say non-Christian nations anymore. I don't care. I don't care whether it's politically correct or not. It's the truth. It's written in God's word, and I'm not, not going to let Satan have the victory because some politic and per person believes in, in political correctness. I don't, okay? If there's something out there that will offend you, you mark it, and mark it well. Now, I'm not telling you to be uh, smart. By that, I mean abrasive to anyone. But you have to take, you have to be wiser than the serpent. And that's one of the serpent's main gifts is teaching and breaking people down to political correctness where you won't even make a stand for Christianity. You'll let them walk all over you for, well, it wouldn't be politically correct. No, I have to take a sandwich, you know. You have to stand up for your right, all right, for Christ's right. We're not second class citizens. You're not to let them. Well, God said to love your enemies. And if someone smites you on the right cheek, turn the other. Well, that's if you're a preacher, because he was talking to those he was sending out to preach. If you overload their donkey, like another minister, and you're way over his head, and he, like maybe you would say, there's no such thing as a rapture. It's not even mentioned in God's word. He might reach out and backhand you, then turn the other cheek because you're the one that messed up, see. But if you're out on the street and some knucklehead comes up and pops you, deck him. Okay? Why? Well, that's not loving your enemy. Oh, yes, it is. What does God say to do to a child to correct him? If you love your child, you're going to correct the child. Okay? 
You're not going to let them run amok. You have to have discipline and there must be order. And that's the way God expects it to be, all right? Um, discipline is, do you, do you understand that's what the word disciple means? Is to discipline yourself in God's word and draw the line and that's it, okay? That's it. That's to be loving, to be understanding, but to stand up for Christ. And if anybody tries to put him down or another brother, you take care of business, all right? Verse 19, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it, is, it will be given you in that same hour that you shall speak. And of course, that hour is the same hour that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 17, verse, what is it, uh, 10, 13, 12, somewhere along in there. The hour of temptation, when the false Christ is here on earth, that's the hour it's talking about, okay? A lot of people are going to be tempted. You're going to be really tempted. You're, you're not supposed to, all right? You're not supposed to give in to that, all right? Verse 20, For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. What is the Spirit of the Father? Have you ever, do you really know? Well, they call it the Holy Spirit. Some people call it the Holy Ghost. Only God ain't no spook, Okay? It's God's Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, pneuma in the Greek, all right? God speaks through you when you're delivered up. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father of the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. First of all, who is death? Okay. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Christ came to this earth, born of a virgin, whereby he could destroy death, which is to say the devil. You're going to be delivered up before the devil, all right? Which is the false Christ. Playing church, all right? A lot of people like to play church. You better know what you're doing. And you better, have, you better stay focused. Because a lot of people are not going to make the train if they're not very careful. That is to say the first resurrection. Oh, we've got the whole Lord's Day to to do some uh, adjusting to attitudes, okay? Why would a brother deliver a brother up to death if he thought it was Jesus? If he thought the Antichrist, who is Mr. Death, was Jesus, he's going to run up and say, you, you, my brother is a good man. He just doesn't understand that you're the Christ. And he will turn you in and deliver you up. It is written, Mark 13, oh, and, and Matthew 24. Not taught all that much, but it is written. Have you read it? Verse 22, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Why would you be hated for all men? Because most men will be deceived. And it's because you wait for the true Christ that you are hated for his sake. And he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Why? Well, that's his promise. It's already done. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. That is to say, until the second advent takes place. And um, what, what is it to be persecuted for Christ? It's a pleasure Okay. It's indeed a pleasure in serving Christ and to make a stand for him and to simply teach his word. To stay focused on what is written, the love letter he has written you. To be well versed within it, whereby you can stand your ground and make a good showing. But at that very moment, it's not you that speak but God's voice and God's spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. 24, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above the Lord. In other words, a disciple, a pupil, is not above the teacher. And Christ is that teacher. He knows what he's talking about. Um, verse 25, it is enough for the disciple, that's to say the student, the one disciplining themselves, in the word of God, that he be as his master um, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, 
That means Lord of the fly, dung hill or the fly heap, okay? Uh, how much more shall they call them of his household? Naturally, they're going to call you the same thing. So what is he warning you about here? Well, it could get a, you, you could be not maybe one of the most popular people in this world. When that time comes that the spurious Messiah walks the earth. Does that bother you? If it does, you got a problem. Because you should be, if you call yourself Christ man, Christian, you should be willing to make a stand for Christ. You, you should stand for something. Otherwise, what would you be? Naturally, you're going to make a stand, and you're going to stand for Christ regardless of what a confused, mixed-up world might do, okay? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. This is what, you know, a lot of people, I, got, I, I can't resist this. A lot of people wonder, well, where are those weapons of mass destruction? There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, okay? Hey, you know what? People are strange. I, and I'm going to si digress just a moment, perhaps. But people get so worried about weapons of mass destruction. Hey, what do you think he knocked off a whole village of Kurds with? 5,000 of them, all at one time. Poor little old babies, mamas holding them. You've seen the pictures. And then you'd have the nerve to ask if he has weapons of mass destruction or had them? Of course he did. We have labeled and list of tons and tons and tons of biological, chemical, and other weapons. And do you know what they haven't found? Not one place where any of that could legally be destroyed. You want me to say that again? Not one place have we found in Iraq that is capable of destroying those chemicals. Well, what does that mean? That means they're still around. They might even be, if you can get two pickup loads of Cuban cigars in one of the boys that we've done away with nicely, his house, then you can get two or three suitcases of that stuff in Cuba. That's just off our coast, and if it happens again, some of these politicians are going to find weapons of mass destruction in their own backyard, and in a sense, it's their fault that they're playing politics instead of keeping their eyes open to what's happening. Any, I don't know what brought that on. I really don't. Here we were studying God. Nothing covered that shall not be revealed. That has a, that's like a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways, doesn't it? Anyway, and what I tell you in darkness, that speak you in light. What the Holy Spirit brings to your unction, and what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. That was the, the place to, to, um, to uh, uh, the usual place of proclamation was from a rooftop. That was the stage, so-called. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, that is such an important verse as to what hell is really about, that you shouldn't overlook it. The word destroy is perish. God can cause your soul, your very being, to perish. So you don't want to worry about people in the world that might mislead you. You want to be pleasing to the good man of the house. That's to say our Father, our Heavenly Father. But do you have anything to worry about? Um, are not two sparrows sold for a forkland? That's one-tenth of a penny. Roman coinage. And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father's knowledge, okay? I mean, he knows everything. He's going to take care of you. He's going to protect you. He keeps good score. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And that's why you want to be careful when you comb your hair. <laughs> that, that is a, a Hebraism that means he will protect you. 
even down to that, okay? Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. That means don't worry. You know, Lord doesn't have much use for a worry wart. Well, I shouldn't say that. He loves worry warts, but he gets impatient with them. He makes all these wonderful promises, and then somebody will say, oh, I'm just frightened. Really? You've got a shepherd, and boy, can he handle things, all right? You don't have anything to be afraid or to worry about. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. I'm going to tell you, when that time comes at his return, that's the crowd you want to be standing in. You don't want to sidetrack yourself. You know, you've got these people that will say, I like a deep study. That's full of malarkey. They don't know what they're talking about. Okay. They leave the word of God and go off into the bushes. Okay. Beware and be careful of dangerous people okay, that will mislead a flock if possible. Don't go. It doesn't pay. Verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Well, how could they deny him and what is it about? His word. How well can you handle it? You know, that's a good place to start, okay? To have, a, have clarity and, and the ability to focus upon the word. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. What is that sword? He didn't, Christ didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And let me tell you something. It is that sword and that sword alone that brings peace. Have you read, ever read chapter 1 of the great book of Revelations, verse 15 and 16? Christ's tongue, his word, this word, is a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. And it is the only way you can attain peace of mind, is to have truth and knowledge in the simplicity. Not in the woods with a fool leading people astray, but in the simplicity in which Christ taught that can lead all people to peace of mind rather than a bunch of fuzzy wuzzies, okay? Keep in mind, simplicity is the way Christ teaches. Anytime it isn't simplified, you're listening to something other than God's word, okay? Good man of the house. You know, you don't have to worry if it's the parable of the good man of the house. And what they call the good man of the house is what they're going to call you. So don't worry if they call you bad things if you're following this word. Because Christ, we have the victory. And what a time it's going to be. All right, we're going to still stick. You all remember the 13th chapter. Let's turn over to it. This is the parable of the sower whereby he said... In Mark, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of them. And it has to do with the sowing of the tares. Chapter 13, great book of Mark, verse 24. And verse 24 reads, listen carefully to the parable. Mark 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying... The kingdom of heaven. Now, what was that? The kingdom. That's the king and his dominion all over heaven. Is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. That's what it's like. Okay. God won't sow anything but good seed. All right. He looked and it was good after he placed people, all the races on this earth at the end of the sixth day. 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. I mean, you had a thief came in the night. And of course, this is, this is the prophecy spoken of in Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. You know who the enemy was that sowed them. Verse 26. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, there appeared the tares also. Do you know why? Because Zawan looks exactly like wheat while they're in, in the growing stage. But one produces a bitter, black, poisonous fruit, and the other, the wheat you have as for bread. Okay? 
27, listen carefully. So the servants of the householder, here's our householder, head man, all right, came and said unto him, Sir, the servant speaking to him. That's God's children speaking to God, saying, Sir, didst thou, did, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? How did they get there? In other words, the servants did report it to the good man of the house. All right? Same word in the Greek, all right? Verse 28. He said unto them, An enemy, who? An enemy hath done this. The servant saith unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Let's go get them. Let's take care of them. Man, we can handle it. Is that what he wants done? No, listen. But he said, no, nay. Lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Now, if there was ever political correctness in the Bible, that's not political correctness. That's wisdom. Okay. There is no way you can take out the tares and, and still say, I be Christian. Right. Why? Because you've got to do it God's way. Well, what did he say? Verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest. That's what the head man said. That's what the householder, God himself said. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, which are the angels, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. And so it is. And so it was. Naturally, it was, as, as you would continue on in verse um, uh, 39, you would find out as Christ was not speaking in a parable, but explaining one, it was the devil that sowed the wicked seed. That's why Cain's genealogy is separate from Adam's. It is written, it is so. Uh, and uh, skip on to verse 51 for me for the sake of time. 51, same chapter. Jesus said unto them, Have you understood all these things? And you really should, beloved. You really should understand these parables. They're very simple. Okay. Then say they unto him, Yea, Lord. Yep, we, we got it. 20, 40, 52. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe, which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of the treasures things new and old, both the New Testament, the Old Testament. And a householder, that's your own house, is going to see that this from the chief householder is what rules your house so that the blessings of God come down upon it. And they surely will. Why? It's his promise. He's the shepherd. He takes care of the sheep. And he takes care of the sheep cot, which is none other than the house of the sheep. Okay, now, having said that, uh, let's skip on then, if we may, to chapter 20 of this great book of uh, Matthew. Chapter 20, and for the sake of time, I'm only going to go right into it. I want you to know that there was an earth age before this one. This is why that God would say in Romans 8, I foreknew you, I predestined you. Before the foundations of this earth, you were justified. Why? At Satan's rebellion, some souls stood against him. And that explains the great word predestination or foreordained as it is utilized. Therefore, when you read of workers in the vineyard, you need to broaden your mind. If you don't quite understand that, don't worry about it. Put it on the shelf and let it sit there, all right? But I say that to prepare you for the in-depth understanding of this parable. Chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder. There's that word again. It's that simple. There's nothing complicated or deep or confusing about it. Which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. 
I mean, that's a very common thing to do when the crop's ready to pull in or when the vines need dressing and Christ is that vine, God is the, is the pruner thereof, all right? You get out of line, God prunes you. Whack, okay? And when he had agreed with the laborers, and the word agreed is very important. They came to a oneness at a, on the price, agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Fair, honest, I mean, we got a contract. It's set, penny a day, okay? Um, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. This would be about 9 a.m., all right? Uh, and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And they went their way. And this, we got people going to work um, early in the morning, and then we got uh, one at nine. You know, they put in a full day back then, okay? They didn't punch the clock on just eight hours. All right. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and, um, and did likewise. This would be about uh, 12 noon and about 3 p.m. But don't you think, I don't care what time it is that people should be invited into the kingdom. Naturally, there's no selfishness in your heart. You know that poor, misguided people that need to know truth. I don't care what time of the day is. I don't care if it's one hour before Christ returns. If they repent and love the Lord and come out of confusion, then they deserve what the ones that were blessed from the very beginning had because it is such a blessing in your life to be blessed of God and be rich because you obey. All right. Uh, God knows what you have need of, and that is rich. Okay, a lot of people have different understandings of rich. If you've got good health, and, um, and you have everything under control, you're rich. Because there's a lot of people that don't. And their minds never let them attain that because they're confused. And they worry too much. And they can never enjoy that peace of mind that you have. That's rich, my friend. Verse 6. And about the 11th hour, I mean, we're all the way at 5 p.m. here, our time. He went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand you here all the day idle? Well, what are you doing this for? Verse 7. And they say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. Now, God believes in putting people to work. Why? Because God doesn't like lazy people necessarily. That's the truth, friend. God considers a lazy person as a set of hinges. You know, this is pro proverbial. It's a proverb. He says, You're like a set of hinges to a door, only you're hinged to a mattress. All a sluggard, a lazy person can do is flop from one side to the other. And that's about the story of their life. Whew! You know? God likes workers. He doesn't like people being idle and standing by, okay? So um, it didn't matter that it was 5 o'clock. He put them to work. Uh, and the reason was, what did they say? Nobody hired us. When you plant seeds, you're hiring people. Okay? You got that? That's the parable. When you plant seeds, you're hiring people. I'm not telling you to become a religious fanatic, but you know when someone comes up to you and they see that, you, that life for you is going along as smooth as smooth peanut butter. All right? I mean, you got it made. Everything for you just falls in place. And pretty soon people say, how is that? What, tell me how... God blesses me. He's my shepherd. I use common sense. I don't worry. I use this up here. I'm wiser than the serpent. I know his game, and I can beat him at his own game. I can make it. I can cut it. People see that, and they're drawn to it. Okay? Anyway, there you have it. It didn't matter that it was the end of the day. Um, okay, verse 7. They say unto him, 
We got that. Eight. So when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard sent unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. It's important. Beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came, and when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. They got the same thing. Don't you know that when you accept Christ, I don't care what time it is, you've got the same thing. Because he's fair to all. And that's the way it should be. There should be no jealousy about that. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. I mean, we were out there early. And they likewise received every man a penny. Uh Uh-oh. Eleven. And when, this is just human nature now, okay? And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house. Now, you want to be careful about this. What did their contract say? I called it to your attention. They had a contract. Work the full day, you get a penny. What did they get? They worked the full day, they got a penny. You see, what you have to look at is they're working in that vineyard the full day, set the example to the others that caused them to want to be in that vineyard, to want to be pruned, to want to shape up, to want to be somebody. And that's a privilege and an honor within itself is to be able to serve God. And they should have never complained. But it's just human nature, okay? What they saying, verse 12, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. I mean, we were out there, that sun was popping down on our backs, and we were slaving at it, sweating for you. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Hey, what are you going to do? That's the contract, okay? Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Do you know what God does though? I'm going to tell you from experience. You may just get the penny, which means salvation for all. But boy, does he take up the slack in your daily life. He didn't tell you about that. He really takes up the slack. He blesses you clear out of your bonnet. You know, that's why you're so fortunate. That's why you have peace of mind. It's because the penny didn't amount to anything. It's his blessings on top of it that are priceless. He's the good man. The good householder. He knows what you need. And when you turn it over to him, you're going to have it, okay? As long as it's not something that hurts you, as long as you don't like to play with snakes, okay? You like to play with snakes, he may not give them to you any more than you would one of your children, all right? There's things he knows you've got no need for, okay? Um, Verse 15, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own now, you need to really think about that one. I mean, hey, it's all his. Far as you can see, it's all his. And he can do whatever he wants to with it. And boy, he can spot a crook ten miles off, all right? You can't beat him. Is thine eye evil because I am good? I would hope not. You know, there should be no selfishness in a family. It should all click right along. 16, so the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few are chosen. That's what takes up the slack. It goes all the way back to the chosen before the foundations of the earth. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, as a clue. What a fantastic time to live in this generation. You know, in Matthew 24, this same old book, he, he told of, uh, he said, hey, just before the end, Satan 
And those fallen angels of Genesis 6 are going to be kissed, kicked back out of heaven. And they're going to be giving and taking in marriage again. Just like they were back in Genesis 6. And he tells what you are supposed to be doing. While all that is happening. What you're supposed to be doing. Alright? So let's take it with verse... Uh, Uh, verse 42, 42, okay? And verse 42 reads, Watch therefore, and this has to do with watching for the return of Christ and the events that go down and how it comes to pass, all right? This is Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. And that's that hour of temptation again. Don't be tempted by Satan as the spurious Messiah. But know this. This is what you need to know. That if the good man of the house, that's why we came here. Who is the good man of the house? That's, that's the Lord. That's the master. Had no one in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken into. 44, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. When do you think that hour that people would be most off guard for Christ to return? When they thought he already had. When the majority thought he had already returned, as Jesus would teach in Matthew chapter 13. If they say he's in the desert, if they say he's somewhere else, don't go. It's the fake. It's the evil one. It's the false Christ. And naturally, when the false Christ is here reigning, they believe he is the true Christ, and they're sure not expecting the real. But that is when he will come. You're even given in the ninth chapter of Revelations that it's five months that that hour of temptation will last, okay? And uh, verse 45, what are you supposed to do then? Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Remember, you're supposed to be wiser than the serpent, and he's here at this time. Whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat. Give them what? Meat. In his due, se in due season. Well, what is meat? God's word, not yours. I said God's word, not yours. This word, this letter, exactly as it's written. Don't take it out of context. Stay focused on it and live your life accordingly. That's what you're supposed to do. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. That's what you're going to be doing. Doing what? Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. He can trust you. Okay? But, and if that evil servant, if one that is supposedly good turns a little evil, shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. It ain't going to happen. It's been this way ever since the beginning of time. Not going to happen. That's your typical everyday idiot talking, okay? Verse 49, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. Whoa, whoa, who, who is this to eat? What drunken? Well, back before we started. Verse 37, but as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He tells you. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. These drunkards marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the, uh, into the ark. Marriage with who? The Nephilim, the fallen angels. Genesis chapter 6. Have you ever read it? Well, uh, and I see a little lady shaking her head. I sure have. And she looks like she's right with it, I'll tell you. That's it. That's the simplicity that Christ would have you understand. Stay true to the course. Don't fall off course. Don't be with that bunch. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of, one that wants to mess around. Stay focused, friends. 
and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, a bunch of it. Okay? Lot, you're living in a generation that even the prophets wanted to live in at this time. It's going down, friend. I mean, it's, well, when is that? Well, nobody knows. But we know that it will transpire in the generation of the fig tree, and that started in the year of our Lord, 1948. Uh, Matthew 24 and Mark 13, documentation for that. And some of us that were living in 1948 is beginning to get some white underneath the color. And, oh, the Irish are kicking up heels here. Anyway, the good man of the house, Icasa, his dwelling place should be yours. He is, let me use the Hebrew for a moment, Ishai, which is to say husband. He is our husband, spiritually speaking. And do you know what? He controls everything. We have absolutely nothing to worry about. The very hairs on your head, he cares about. And um, he knows what you have need of. And when you serve him, well, so, and you'll have some person will say, well, I wonder why he's never given me any of it. Well, what have you done? Well, I ain't done nothing. Well, that's why you deserve nothing. I mean, that's, that's swift, right? I mean, you've got to love him and be honest with him. You can't con God. Trust me, you can't. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the privilege of serving you. Again, Father, we thank you for the word. Bless us in it, and we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.